Hello, I'm Anawiltus. A few years ago, I made a big chart about the genealogical heir of Charlemagne based on a number of different ways to go genealogically. And today, I'm going to give a bit of a follow-up to that, and that is the legal heir of Charlemagne. So the way I did this is I took each person in the uh, line of succession, uh, as it happens, and... When that person died, I asked myself a question, who is the heir of a body, who is the legal heir of this individual? And I am well aware that uh, in many of these situations, there may have been a partable inheritance. But when there was a partable inheritance, that is when there were multiple inheritors, I picked the most senior inheritor or the inheritor that uh, received the greater part of the inheritance. Now, a, a few more uh, qualifications here. So this means I'm not basing the inheritance solely on the laws of succession that were in place at the time of Charlemagne, but more on how they developed over time, and therefore the reasons why certain people inherit things on this list will actually change at later points in time. And another thing to note is that this is simplified uh, to some extent. I'm not taking every single argument, uh, even though I am looking at a couple of alternate routes that uh, people can take. I am not making a comprehensive argument, nor am I making an argument that everything that can be inherited is something that should be inherited. So this is obviously going to be based on a bit of opinion, and I'm sure that there's people that would disagree with my opinion for various reasons. But I think I can make a strong enough case to argue that my opinion is at least reasonable enough uh, for me to make a video such as this. So this is a bit color-coded. White is, is just uh, plain individuals who uh, are perhaps relevant for the chart, but who uh, don't really have anything to do with the inheritance directly. Red is the direct line of Charlemagne, uh, which of course uh, dies out after a few generations, at which point uh, the inheritance becomes more complicated. Blue is what I use uh, for the uh, inheritance as I consider it, so that is my opinion. Yellow is for alternate routes, and green is uh, for women that m themselves may not have been the inheritors, uh, but who are important for the inheritance in their own time. Of course, there's other women that are important for the inheritance, uh, but who themselves uh, aren't individuals uh, through whom the inheritance directly goes through. So here we go. So Charlemagne himself lived roughly from 747 to 814, um, Anno Domini, of course, and he built a relatively large empire. He eventually was crowned Roman Emperor. Um, the titles I'm using are uh, somewhat historical, somewhat anachronistic. You always have to put a, a balance on how uh, detailed you want to be with historical accuracy. For example, Charlemagne, as far as I'm aware, wasn't called uh, officially King of Italy. It was King of the Lombards. But for consistency, I've decided to put King of Italy. And uh, just like there might be some individuals later on who might be called Holy Roman Emperor, but I'm going to use Roman Emperor for consistency and uh, for uh, uh, coherence with official documents as well. And the names I'm using are generally uh, the most common name that are familiar to uh, Western individuals. Uh, for these individuals. So Charlemagne's, uh, when he died, his son, who had already been crowned uh, during his own lifetime in order to ensure a smooth succession, Louis the Pious uh, was his successor. And in fact, he was his only successor uh, because uh, although Charlemagne had other sons, uh, by the time of Charlemagne's death, there wasn't really anybody else left uh, to inherit the titles. So Louis the Pious inherited a united uh, kingdom of the Franks, uh, which uh, is in stark contrast to the tradition of dividing the kingdom. 
uh, which we see in the next generation. In fact, Louis the Pious had some problem with his own sons, which led to them uh, already carving up uh, realms within uh, the kingdom while he was still uh, the emperor. Uh, but uh, his primary successor uh, out of his three, three sons, I'm, I'm not including uh, uh, the other one because he's not important uh, to this uh, list, uh, was uh, Lothair who inherited the middle uh, realm of the Franks, which included Italy, uh, Burgundy, and the core region of Austrasia, as, as well as uh, the, the Frisian territory that the Franks had conquered. And uh, when he died, his kingdom was divided between his sons into three pieces, uh, Italy, Burgundy, and uh, a realm uh, uh, eventually called uh, Lotharingia, from which we get uh, Lorraine today uh, as a regional name. Uh, but the primary inheritor was uh, Louis uh, the, the Second. Uh, although it, back in those days people didn't really use regular numbers, I'm using it for ease of identification. Who inherited the imperial title as well as the Italian lands. Uh, but when Louis died, uh, he is said. And of course, this is based on historical records to have considered Carloman of Bavaria to be his heir to the kingdom of Italy, although Italy uh, was taken over for a brief time uh, by the king of the West Franks. Uh, uh, because Louis II, he didn't have any sons of his own, so the uh, inheritance wasn't very uh, clear. However, uh, Carloman of Bavaria uh, who, who had been the king of the Franks in Bavaria, and this is an, another note to put out here, uh, all these different Frankish kings, they weren't necessarily uh, called kings of the region that they controlled. They, they were all technically kings of the Franks. Uh, and in fact, uh, even in the German monarchs, continued to be called king of the Franks, uh, even past the Ottonian dynasty. They continue to use that as uh, their primary uh, title for, for their kingdom. So I'm putting in parentheses the particular realm of the greater uh, kingdom of the Franks that, uh, that these individuals ruled. So Carloman of Bavaria, obviously he ruled in Bavaria, but eventually also in Italy. Uh, however, in, in his last days, uh, his brothers decided to divide... Uh, Car Carloman's uh, kingdom, although Carloman, it seems, had preferred uh, to instead have it be inherited uh, by his illegitimate son, Arnulf uh, of Carinthia, who uh, eventually uh, would uh, come back to power, uh, but at this point in his life uh, did not rule one of the major realms. Uh, however, the primary inheritance then... Uh, went to Louis the Younger, if you assume that uh, Carloman's wish to have his illegitimate son inherit uh, the kingdom was uh, illegitimate or illegal, and that therefore uh, his brother, Louis the Younger, uh, who inherited Bavaria, the center of power of uh, Carloman, uh, had therefore the more legitimate claim to be uh, his inheritor. Uh, however, Louis the Younger himself only died a couple years later, and therefore uh, his uh, younger brother, Charles the Fat, inherited uh, Louis the Younger's realm, and he also managed to control uh, almost all of the different Frankish realms, uh, therefore uh, briefly reuniting uh, Charlemagne's empire uh, and also uh, achieving the title of Roman Emperor. Uh, however, when in, in his last years he was deposed in a number of, dif uh, of, of uh, different kingdoms of his, and uh, by the way, the dates are for when they uh, w could be considered the inheritors of Charlemagne, not when they ruled overall, uh, because these individuals ruled uh, before uh, other events. Uh, in his last days, it, it is said 
that he adopted Louis the Blind, who uh, was a grandson of uh, Louis II, as well as a son of Boso of Provence, uh, and, and that therefore he would have considered Louis the Blind his legitimate heir. However, uh, Charles the Fat was deposed in uh, a lot of his kingdoms, uh, and uh, I'm not going to count depositions and usurpations as uh, legal forms of inheritance. However, if you were to count that, then Arnulf of Carinthia uh, presumably capitalized the most off of the fall of Charles the Fat. Uh, and, however, uh, Arnulf of Carinthia didn't uh, live too long to uh, manage to conquer much of the rest of the realm, and uh, eventually he was succeeded by his son, uh, Louis, uh, the child, although he, uh, for some time, had attempted to make uh, a couple of his illegitimate sons uh, more prominent in the succession, but ultimately the, su the succession went to his son, uh, Louis the child. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Louis the Blind managed to uh, expand from his realm to, of Provence to become the king of Italy and to achieve the imperial title. However, uh, another usurper managed to uh, beat him and he blinded him. And at this point in history, uh, being blind means that you're not in the best position to be a ruler. Uh, however, meanwhile, uh, in Germany, uh, or East Francia, Louis the Child had died, and his successor eventually became uh, Conrad uh, the Younger, who was uh, the Duke of Franconia, and uh, was of a, a Frankish heritage. However, when Conrad died, his primary inheritor became uh, his brother, Eberhard. However, uh, the kingship was passed to another prominent nobleman in the realm, uh, Henry the Fowler. However, uh, I would consider Eberhard the heir of the body or the legal heir of Conrad because Conrad didn't have any children of his own and his core uh, territory in Franconia had been passed to his brother. So keep that in mind for the alternate succession. Uh, however, uh, eventually Louis the Blind, uh, having been kicked out of Italy, eventually died, and uh, one of the prominent uh, noblemen of his court, uh, Hugh of uh, Arlay, who was Louis the Blind's brother-in-law, and Louis the Blind did not have any children, uh, became his successor, and eventually moved in and conquered Italy. And after he died, his son, uh, Lothar II, also became the king of Italy. Uh, meanwhile, uh, another uh, grandson, uh, sorry, a, a granddaughter of uh, Louis the Blind's sister, uh, Guilla of uh, Provence, uh, Adelaide, uh, was married to Lothar II, and she herself was also a daughter of Rudolf II, who had been the king of Burgundy and Italy. And, uh, and, and therefore, uh, she was related to Rudolf II as the daughter of the king of Italy. She was uh, married to the king of Italy and also the daughter-in-law uh, to the king of Italy, uh, making her uh, very important when Lothar II died without any successor. And, uh, and therefore, uh, another usurper in Italy uh, had planned for his son to marry Adelaide in order to uh, legitimize his claim to the Italian throne. Uh, and it is by some presume that Lothar II had actually been poisoned uh, by this usurper, but he's not important uh, to the genealogy here. Uh, so Adelaide, therefore, 
in this time period is considered important for who would become the legitimate king of Italy and therefore inherit uh, the realm of Lothar II. And ultimately, she managed to escape, uh, having refused to marry the son of a usurper, and uh, and having been imprisoned, she managed to escape and went to Germany and married the king there, uh, Otto the Great. Uh, not the great quite yet at this point in history, but who happened to also be the son of Henry the Fowler, uh, who some years before, uh, after a rebellion, had... Uh, deposed, had uh, taken away all the lands of Eberhard of Franconia, there, and, and Eberhard did not have any heirs, uh, leading to this alternative uh, lineage dying out. And Otto the Great managed to pull together uh, the Eastern Franks, the German realm, and he also conquered Italy and uh, made efforts to... Uh, to revive the Roman Empire, as he had also achieved the imperial title, uh, which uh, at this point in history had been frequently associated with the kings of Italy uh, after uh, the end of the uh, main line of Charlemagne. Now, Otto the Great was then succeeded by his son, Otto the Second, who was succeeded by his son, Otto III, who died without any heirs uh, at a relatively young age, and therefore a, uh, a question arose over who would succeed him as uh, the king in Germany uh, and uh, ultimately the imperial title, and ultimately his relative, uh, Henry uh, who had been the Duke of Bavaria, decided to take up the inheritance of Otto III, and the nobles of the realm agreed that this was a legitimate succession. So Henry II became uh, the new king of the Eastern Franks, as well as the king of Italy and the Holy Roman Emperor. However, he himself did not have any heirs when he died, so, some questions arose over who would uh, be his successor, and ultimately, the successor of the successors of the Leudal things or the Ottonians uh, would be the Salian dynasty, uh, descended from Conrad the Red, who was the Duke of Lorraine in his time. And Lutgard of Saxony, a daughter uh, of Otto the Great, from his first marriage. And you might say, but since she's a daughter from his first marriage, wouldn't she, wouldn't her lineage not be able to inherit uh, from uh, the other lineage of Adelaide and, and Lothair and uh, Louis the Second, etc.? And the thing is, we're not asking the question of can we justify multi-generational inheritance? The question I'm asking is who is the heir of a body of the previous heir of a body going back to Charlemagne? So uh, Henry II was the legal heir of Otto III uh, and going back, and therefore Henry II's legal heir becomes the legal heir regardless of... Uh, previous uh, engagements as uh, this is how inheritances actually work. It, it's not always a clear genealogical question of is this person directly related to another person? And in many cases, they don't have to be because uh, Conrad II, who eventually became uh, the new uh, Roman emperor, as well as the king of the East Franks, uh, king of Italy, and eventually also uh, became the king of Burgundy, uh, taking it from the descendants of the previous kings of Burgundy. Um, he was related to Henry II uh, and to Otto the Great uh, and to Henry the Fowler. And Otto the Great was related to Adelaide, who was related to uh, Lothair and Rudolf and Hugh uh, and uh, Louis and Louis the, again. So 
Henry II's heir was Conrad II. So, and, and this brings me to another topic that I don't think is well known enough uh, among people that uh, look into uh, the history here. And that is that the Ottonian, the Salian, and the Hohenstaufen dynasties in Germany are all actually related to each other in a way cl closely enough that you can argue that they are each other's successors. So while they are different dynasties, they have different lineages, they are related closely enough to each other that you can argue that they are in fact each other's legal successors. And that's something I don't see a lot of people talking about when they look into uh, these dynasties. They just simply think the lineage died out, so people elected uh, new leaders from the realm. But it turns out that the reason why a lot of these individuals were elected for the kingship is because they were actually related to the previous dynasty. And this is the case for Conrad II. And he was succeeded by his son, Henry III, uh, who was succeeded by Henry IV, who was succeeded by his son, Henry V. And at this point, the Salian line died out, and th there was a uh, succession struggle in the uh, Holy Roman Empire, uh, per perhaps not quite called Holy Roman Empire at, at this time. However, uh, you, you may have noticed uh, the kingdom of the Franks uh, was eventually replaced by the kingdom of the Romans uh, in, in reference to the German kingdom in, in the realm uh, d during the Salian dynasty. But th there, there, were, there was a huge problem in, in the later Salian emperors because of some disagreements that they had uh, with the popes and an investiture crisis that occurred at this point where uh, one of the popes had declared an emperor to be... Uh, deposed and therefore a number of noblemen rose out throughout the empire to select their own emperor uh, and this crisis eventually escalated and led to a succession struggle and part of the succession struggle was that after henry v died uh his nephew frederick ii uh who was the duke of Swabia, uh, of uh, Schwaben, he wanted to inherit uh, the personal uh, possessions and the lands of Henry V, the, the lands that he held within the empire. Not necessarily the imperial title itself, but at least the lands that uh, he held in, in the empire because he was his next of kin, so to say. And... This led to a bit of a war, and Frederick eventually lost one of his eyes. And uh, because he lost one of his eyes, he was not considered eligible to uh, to become emperor uh, at this time. Uh, because once again, being handicapped doesn't make you the most capable emperor. Because in, in these days, one of the uh, main things the emperor was considered responsible for was leading the armies of the realm uh, when they when the realm goes to war. So uh, instead of him becoming emperor uh, or king, it was his brother, Conrad, who became the king. However, when Conrad died, uh, Frederick's son, uh, also named Frederick, uh, famously known as uh, Frederick Barbarossa, became the uh, new king and eventually emperor. And this is when we uh, get into the Hohenstaufen uh, dynasty here. And uh, Frederick, and I'm not going to put all of the dynasty, I'm only going to put people that I think are relevant. Uh, when Frederick died, he was succeeded by his son, Henry, who uh, was very powerful in his own right. Uh, all of these individuals were relatively powerful. Like you could argue that this was one of the more powerful phases in the history of the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, but uh, Henry VI was so powerful, he, he got the uh, East Roman Empire, the Byzantines, to pay tribute to him. Uh, and he got uh, a, a number of kingdoms to uh, 
uh, and realms to uh, offer vassalage to him. So uh, perhaps one of the more underrated Holy Roman Emperors. Uh, I don't hear a lot of people talking about him. I, I hear a lot of people talking about uh, his father or his son. Uh, but Henry VI is actually pretty interesting and managed to accomplish quite a bit in his relatively short reign. Uh, but when Henry died, his son Frederick was a bit too young to rule anything. And so a new succession crisis uh, emerged uh, where uh, Henry's brother, Philip, uh, went to uh, become king in opposition to, of course, uh, the the Guelf or Welf dynasty that uh, was uh, also vying for power. And this is the time where we have the guelph Ghibelline conflict uh, between individuals supporting uh, imperial investiture and papal investiture. Again, once again, another uh, segment of the investiture crisis, which eventually became a much more uh, larger cultural phenomenon, especially in Italy, where the way people dress, the, the types of... Uh, the ways the the architecture was on buildings and just a whole lot of different things the flags people had were all determined by uh, which of these two important political factions they belonged to so I, I think that's pretty interesting uh, to see how polarized uh, Italian culture was uh, at the time uh, but eventually uh, Philip of Swabia uh, he died and uh, and the, the Guelph emperor died, and ultimately uh, Frederick, uh, the son of Henry, became the new king, uh, being the uh, king of the Romans, so, so the, the rule of Germany, uh, of Italy, of Burgundy, and of course uh, his father had married the Queen of Sicily, so, also, so he also became the king of Sicily, and he himself married the Queen of Jerusalem, so he became the king of Jerusalem. So a, a relatively large realm. Uh, he spent most of his time in Italy and Sicily. Didn't spend a lot of time in Germany, um, which I, I suppose explains why he ended up not uh, making too big of an impression on some of the German lords. Uh, but ultimately, when he died, the Hohenstaufen power uh, really dissipated and uh, his son, Conrad, managed to uh, rule some parts of the realm, but uh, ultimately the Hohenstaufens had fallen out of favor with the lords of the empire, and he wasn't able to gain much power for long. And when he died, he was succeeded by his son, uh, Conradin, who ruled Sicily, uh, uh, somewhat, and he held the title of King of Jerusalem, but he wasn't really doing anything there. And the, the Hohenstaufen's realm just uh, splintered. Different lords were taking different parts of it, and uh, different uh, individuals were disputing the inheritances of various kingdoms. Uh, so after Conradin died, the Hohenstaufen realm, you, you could argue, uh, had completely fallen apart. Uh, however, he was ultimately succeeded in his claims by his cousin, uh, Frederick, who became the Margrave of Meissen and the, the Landgraf von Thüringen. Uh, so he, he was a, a ruler in Germany. Uh, and this is by way of Margaret, uh, who uh, was a daughter of Frederick, who you could argue became the heiress of uh, the realm. Uh, however, the, the real uh, heir uh, who actually uh, made claims to all these titles was Frederick. And this is uh, now occurring in... Uh, Thuringia and Saxony, and uh, and and this is uh, part of uh, a broader dynasty or house that people call Wetten. Uh, however, I I will point out that uh, this dynasty frequently practiced partible inheritance, 
So once again, I will emphasize that I'm only looking at the senior or primary line. Of course, making uh, adaptions in cases where the succession is not that smooth. So when Frederick died, he was succeeded by Frederick II, Frederick III, and ultimately uh, the dynasty managed to achieve the dignity of the electors uh, of Saxony, uh, thereby becoming one of the realms that uh, ma that were involved in electing the emperors. However, uh, at, at this point, uh, I believe the House of Luxembourg was relatively strong, but pretty soon afterwards the uh, Habsburgs would become powerful. And, uh, and at that point, the... Uh, imperial inheritance went relatively smoothly for the most part, so the uh, act of election became um, a, a formality to some extent. But they continued holding the electorate of Saxony, eventually uh, absorbing uh, their other sub-realms into and consolidating uh, their power. Uh, so uh, eventually, uh, Frederick the Wise, uh, one thing I'd, I'd like to say about him is that he was ruling uh, Saxony at the time of Martin Luther. Uh, he himself uh, was not converted to Lutheranism. Uh, however, he held a standard of wanting Luther to have a fair trial of, uh, because he was his subject. And of course, uh, this is the uh, what people, uh, historiographers, refer to as the Ernestine branch of uh, Saxony, the, the other being the uh, Albertine branch, I believe. Uh, I may be wrong on that one, uh, because I know uh, there, there's something relating to the House of Habsburg where there's similar terminology, uh, but uh, this was the senior branch of the house, uh, of, of the realm, and, and there was a younger branch that eventually, due to uh, political and religious reasons, achieved the electoral dignity, but I would not consider them to be heirs of a body of the previous electors uh, in a legal sense, although they did uh, become heirs of the electorate. So anyway, uh, Frederick was succeeded by his brother John, and uh, Saxony uh, eventually became a stronghold of Lutheranism. Uh, John Frederick uh, became the elector, and John Frederick II uh, eventually succeeded him. However, due to the Schmalkaldic War and uh, other religious conflicts, uh, the electorate of Saxony fell out of favor uh, with the emperor, and eventually the electoral dignity was passed over to the other branch of the family. And uh, ultimately, uh, in the time of uh, John Frederick II, the duchy itself uh, was taken away from him and given to his brother, uh, John William, who uh, I'm putting here as an alternative uh, successor, although he was not heir of the body at... Uh, the time. Uh, but eventually, uh, the uh, realms were repartitioned so that John Frederick II's sons uh, could receive an inheritance uh, from their father. And, and therefore, the heir of a body, the legal heir, in my view, would be John Casimir, uh, followed by his brother, John Ernest, or Ernst, if you're German, Johann Ernst, uh, and at this point, uh, historiographers, and, and also in history, uh, the Duchy of Saxony, uh, due to the partition of uh, inheritance, becomes known by uh, a, a number of different names as uh, different branches of the family break off pieces of the realm, and these are generally named after the major 
city or the, or the major town in that part. So these are the uh, Ernestine duchies, uh, named, named after Ernest, uh, the, the leader of this branch of the family. And, and due, the, due to the partible inheritance, the different parts of Saxony have different names. So uh, Johann Casimir became the Duke of Sachsen-Coburg-Eisenach, uh, therefore the part of Saxony that uh, has Coburg and Eisenach in it. And, uh, however, this uh, lineage, the lineage of John Frederick II, eventually died out, and his uh, inheritor became, uh, the inheritor of John Ernest became John Philip, the grandson of John William, uh, who was from the Saxon Weimar branch of uh, the dynasty, uh, he himself becoming the Duke of Saxon Altenburg. Uh, however, uh, in, in his years, he decided that in the case that he and, and his branch of the family uh, were to die out, the inheritor or the uh, inheritance would pass through uh, his daughter, Elizabeth Sophie. So when he died, uh, the inheritance first went to his brother, uh, Frederick William II, who then died, uh, le leading the inheritance going to Frederick William III, who was very young, uh, and he died, and therefore the inheritance uh, went to the husband of uh, Elizabeth Sophie, uh, Ernst, uh, the Duke, uh, who, who then became the, who, who had been the Duke of uh, Saxe-Gotha, uh, who then became the Duke of saxon altenburg who was the uh, grandson of John William through his son, John II. Now, he was not the most senior uh, in the whole house. However, he was the uh, heir general, the, the primary heir of uh, Frederick William III uh, due to the will of John Philip. So he inherited the greater part of the realm uh, when Frederick William III died, even though there was a repartition of uh, these various duchies. And I'm not putting uh, all the other uh, Saxon dukes on here because there's actually quite a few of them. Uh, but anyway, he was succeeded by his son, Frederick, uh, who was succeeded by his son, Frederick, who was succeeded by his son, Frederick, uh, going down to uh, Ernst. And, uh, and in the time of Napoleon, uh, Augustus, who uh, was apparently a friend of Napoleon, uh, and when he died, he was succeeded by his brother, Frederick IV, who also uh, didn't produce any male heir. So the inheritance went by a, a more junior line, uh, the um, Duchy of saxon coburg Saalfeld, uh, to... Ernst, who uh, had to repartition the realm uh, between the other duchies because they weren't uh, too happy about him uh, inheriting quite a bit. So he became the Duke of Sachsen-Coburg and Gotha. And, and, and the reason it's and or und, und Gotha, is because the... Uh, the part of a realm that was Saxon-Coburg and uh, Saxon-Gotha did not want to uh, integrate uh, with each other fully uh, and, and become one political entity uh, to the fullest extent. So it, it became a more of a federal state with uh, two portions. So, uh, however, he did end up having to give up Altenburg to another branch of a family. So when he died, his successor was Ernst II, the Duke of uh, saxon coburg und Gotha, uh, who didn't have any heirs of his own, but his brother, Albert, had married Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom. Uh, but because uh, Germany was unifying at this point, and uh, by 1893 uh, had already unified into the German Empire, um, it would be inconvenient for the uh, British monarch to also be the monarch of a federal state within Germany. 
and also it seems to have been unpopular with the residents of uh, of Saxon Coburg and Gotha, and so the uh, succession was decided that instead of the primary heir of uh, Albert and Victoria, uh, who would become the king, and who, who I'm not putting on here, but uh, just just know that he exists, okay, e eventually became the king, uh, that he would not inherit, and instead, uh, uh, Ernst, uh, his primary heir would be one of the younger sons, and that ended up being Alfred, uh, who eventually became uh, the duke. But... He didn't have any sons of his own, so the inheritance went through a, an even younger son of uh, Albert and Victoria, Leopold, or Leopold, the, depending on, uh, on on what you say, uh, who I think by this point was dead, uh, and he had been the Duke of Albany. Uh, however, at this point, a lot of these titles didn't come with a lot of real power, maybe a little bit, uh, but not a lot. And therefore, the inheritance passed to Charles Edward, uh, Duke of uh, Saxe Coburg and Gotha. However, uh, the German Empire eventually fell apart, and therefore his realm uh, was uh, it, it became a democracy, and became uh, repartitioned into various uh, federal German states. Uh, in, in the Weimar Republic uh, and later on uh, Nazi Germany and later on uh, Federal Germany uh, or I, I think more East Germany uh, if I remember my geography correctly. But anyway, his, uh, he, he nevertheless continued to be a man uh, of wealth with an estate and uh, continued to have his noble... Uh, privileges acknowledged at least by other noblemen of Europe. Uh, so, uh, therefore, he did have an inheritance to pass on, and his inheritance was not passed on to his oldest son uh, because uh, his oldest son had uh, had an unequal marriage, uh, therefore a marriage with someone of a wrong class, and therefore his uh, inheritance went to a younger son of his, uh, Friedrich uh, Josias, uh, or Josias, Frederick Josias, if you say, uh, who became a prince of Saxon Coburg und Gotha. Uh, uh, of course, not the actual duke, because the duchy didn't exist anymore, but he, he nevertheless retained the title, and he died in 1998, uh, making, since then, the heir of uh, him, uh, as well as his grandfather, Charles Edward, uh, Andreas, uh, who is uh, alive today as this video is being made. And this is a picture of him. And uh, he still uh, meets with other uh, noblemen, as uh, the old nobility tend to do nowadays. So, arguably speaking, uh, at least it is my argument that he... Uh, is the legal heir of Charlemagne, uh, at least uh, going through uh, the successor in each generation, legally speaking. I suppose the uh, most questionable part here uh, is arguably uh, whether Otto the Great would be the inheritor um, due to uh, the question of who should become king of Italy. I think that that's probably the weakest part here. However, uh, the fact that the uh, Italian usurpers uh, believed that whoever Adelaide would marry uh, was actually very relevant to their legitimacy in the kingship of Italy indicates to me that at least uh, in the realm she was in, the, the it was considered uh, important uh, for the inheritance who she would marry. But anyway... Tell me what you think in the comment section below. Do you have your own ideas, uh, different ideas? And by the way, once again, this is not uh, a genealogical uh, argument of who would be his successor based on primogeniture or anything like that. This is uh, looking at each generation, uh, who was the legal heir of 
X person and going on down and down the generations. So therefore, Andreas is the heir of a body of Charlemagne uh, through all of the previous heirs, as well as of Otto the Great and uh, the Salian dynasty and the Hohenstaufen dynasty and uh, a number of other individuals. <laughs> so that I, I, find, I find that very interesting. Uh, I don't think it's particularly important politically, but nevertheless, something interesting to learn about. So anyway, tell me what you think. Uh, do you have any disagreements? Uh, please leave your comments in the comments section below, and I will be seeing you all next time on Wiltus Over and Out.